We're starting the book of Hosea this morning. Marvelous book of Hosea. All right. I do have a couple quick announcements. Um, first, uh, first announcement I want to talk about uh, this afternoon about uh, Pastor Chuck's memorial service. Um, today's the day, and uh, it will be at the Honda Center, and if you want to try to get in there, good luck. Uh, it only holds, only, uh, only holds 20,000 people. Um, I would imagine you probably need to start lining up about now, I guess. I don't know. I have no idea what it's going to be like. I don't know that anybody knows what it's going to be like. I, on the other hand, have a special VIP pass, <laughs> and they have reserved two seats for me and my wife. So I'm going to actually get in the door, sorry. Um, but, but the cool thing is, is that we're, gonna, we're a part of the simulcast. And it's all hooked up. We've already tested the feed and everything. It runs really good on, on here. And so uh, you can come here, and we're going to be broadcasting it just like, you were sitting in, just like you were sitting in the overflow at Costa Mesa. And um, so we will be doing it here from 5 to 8. I think Drew's going to open up the doors at 4.30 if you want to come here early. You can watch it at home. You go to PastorChuckSmith.com. I think it's in your bulletin. And you can watch it on home on your computer as well. We will not be uh, putting it up on Ustream because there's no need to. Uh, if you want to watch it at home, you can go to PastorChuckSmith.com and watch it there. Secondly, um, last Thursday we did a movie night. And we showed this. It was really cool. I don't know if any. Uh, is, was anybody here Thursday night? Did anybody see the movie? Wasn't it cool? I, I liked that movie. It's a great movie about Jose, it was, it was this one called Amazing Love. And the fellow that produces these movies, neat guy, and he's got a heart to get uh, Christian movies into homes to give you something healthy to watch. And so he's got this deal that he, he agreed to extend it through tomorrow for us. That it's, it's five movies for 20 bucks, you can't beat it. Um, and in fact, if you tried to buy the Gospel of John alone on Amazon, I think it's about 15 bucks at least that it'll run you. So. Uh, if you want to do that, Lori will be outside taking the last couple orders. Um, you don't have to pay today. We'd appreciate it if you paid today, but we just want to let you know that we've got an extension on that, and we will order the stuff tomorrow, and we'll get it to you by next Sunday, hopefully. So, um, Hosea. Here we go. Book of Hosea. In the days of Hosea, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom known as Judah the northern kingdom kept the name of Israel. It's also sometimes called Ephraim, and sometimes it's called Samaria, which, is, which was its capital city. The, the boundary line was just south of Bethel, and so everything south of Bethel was typically the southern kingdom called Judah. The northern kingdom is everything north up here. Hosea lives and speaks to the northern kingdom. Um, there are a couple other prophets at work at the same time. I believe uh, Jonah is just finishing up his prophets, his his ministry when this guy comes in. Also, the other one, Amos, is is at the same time. The southern kingdom has the prophets Isaiah and Micah at this time. Um, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. His name is Hosea, Hoshea. He's the son of a fellow named Beeri, which means my well. It doesn't have anything to do with beer, so don't even go there. Go there, okay? In the Bible, often, names have significance because, see, they didn't name their kids with things that you have to look up in a dictionary to find out what the name means. They just named him for what it was. If he looked like a donkey, they called him donkey. If the kid looked like a monkey, they called him monkey. Uh, you don't have to say, well, what does Richard mean? Let me look it up in the name, the, the child's name dictionary. No, you don't have to do that because if it meant foolish looking, they called him foolish looking. That's just the way they, they, they name things. Hosea, his name means salvation. And you're going to see Woven through here, that's kind of important because that's what his message is all about, is about salvation. i got to go off on a tangent, pick up some things on the cutting room floor because I had just like about 30 seconds extra at the end of the service last week. Hosea 
if you add the word of even the name of Yahweh to it, you get Yahshua or Joshua, the fellow that brought them into the promised land, which also happens to be the Jewish form of the name Jesus. Another fellow, Isaiah, same name, same idea. These are all the same names, forms of the same name. His ministry, it says, in the, was in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. These are kings of the southern kingdom of Judah who reigned during Hosea's ministry. This gives us the actual beginning and the ending dates of his ministry. Hosea lived during the time of the fall of the northern kingdom because the two kingdoms would one day eventually completely be wiped out. First, the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. Hosea lived before and through and after the fall of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians. Um, his ministry is to warn the nation of the coming judgment. And the judgment would come during his ministry. It also mentions Jeroboam, the son of Joash, who was the king of the northern kingdom. Now, if you, if you look at the timelines and, and all, he's just kind of mentioned as an aside because he would give us the beginning date of Hosea's ministry because uh, he dies in 753 B.C. and all the rest of the other guys were all after that. So this gives us the beginning date. There are actually six kings of the northern kingdom who all reigned during Hosea's ministry, but they're not mentioned. Why? Probably because God didn't even recognize them. Jeroboam would reign for 41 years in the northern kingdom. And though he is called in scripture in the book of Kings, 2 Kings, he is called an evil king because all of the northern kingdoms were, kings were called evil. He did bring prosperity to the nation. It even says that he saved Israel. He expanded the kingdom. The stock market was up. Interest rates were down. Full employment. People had jobs. They were doing well. But I'll tell you, spiritually, they were bankrupt. And even though I know some of us complain about the economy, and I know that not all of you have jobs, but for the most part, our nation is quite prosperous. And we are also equally quite spiritually bankrupt. So you're going to see some interesting parallels. You're going to be thinking, oh my gosh, why doesn't somebody say this to our nation? Well, I, I hope people are saying these things to our nation. Very similar times that we live in. Messages about coming judgment are going to sound pretty unlikely because the guy who's been reigning, Jeroboam, that it was actually called Jeroboam II, but he's the guy who rescued them from lots of their enemies. And yet during Hosea's ministry, the Assyrians would eventually march in from the north and they'd begin to pick off the major cities. For hot, first, Hatsor and Damascus would be picked off in 734 BC. And then Megiddo would be wiped out in 732 B.C., and by 722 B.C., the entire northern kingdom is gone. Hosea will go through to 710 B.C., 715, something like that. So he lives through this whole mess. Verse 2, chapter 1, verse 2. I'm titling this next section, Hosea's Messy Family. That's my pericope of the paragraph. When the Lord began to speak, by Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Now, this is not the typical thing that God would ask his prophet to do. It's quite unusual. He asks Hosea to marry a prostitute, and he's supposed to have children with her, children which may or may not be his children because she's a working girl. He's asked to do this because his life will become a picture of what God's relationship with his people is like. Hosea will be representing God, God has this marriage, this connection with his nation of Israel. And God's people have been unfaithful to him like a harlot. So you're going to have to ask yourself, through this book, 
how does God treat a harlot? And I got to tell you, the answer may not be completely like you think. Hopefully we're not going to be asked to do what Hosea did. But like it or not, our lives, my life and your life, these are God's favorite ways of speaking to people. Some people prefer pictures than they do books. And your life is a picture. In a way, your life is like a book. When, when people were questioning Paul's ministry among the Corinthians, he wrote this, clearly you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. He was saying to the Corinthians, you're my best recommendation letter. Your lives are my best recommendation letter. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. If you, if you type that in in Google, pictures worth a thousand, you find fascinating pictures. Some people do prefer the picture books. My friends, you are the picture book. You are perhaps the only Bible some people will ever read. That's you and I. Verse 3. So he went and took Gomer, the son of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. He went and took, he found a prostitute. Her name was Gomer. Her name means complete. I do have a picture of her. Golly, Sergeant Carter. Now, you will only know that if you're over 50 years old. The rest of you are going, huh? Huh? What's this? What's this? Gomer Pyle. No, that's not her. Sorry. Uh, it's, ask your dad <laughs> if you don't know what that is. Verse 4. And the Lord said to him, then the Lord said to him, he's had a son. Call his name Jezreel or Yetzreel. Yetzreel, for in a little while I will avenge the blood of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now, Yetzreel, the name means God sows. It doesn't mean too much right now. It will at the end of our study. When we get to the end of chapter 2, it will mean something. Um, this name, though, at the moment means more because of its connection with a place. There was a place called Jezreel. Jezreel is the name of a city where wicked King Ahab had a summer palace. It's where when his captain Jehu came to take over, he wiped out all the descendants of, of, uh, uh, of Ahab at Jezreel. Jezreel is also, and that's the blood that's being avenged because he... Even though Jehu was a pretty good guy, he was a bloody man. And God's saying he's going to avenge the blood of Jezreel. But Jezreel is also the name of a valley that kind of runs along here without the coffee jitters. Um, there's a ridge of hills along here. This is Mount Gilboa. This is where, where Megiddo is. There's a pass that runs through Megiddo down along the coast. Megiddo is the city that sits up on a bluff that kind of guards the, 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 the gateway into the valley. Um, uh, so Jezreel both refers to, it can refer to the city of Jezreel where the summer palace was. It could also refer to the valley. And God says he's, and it says verse five, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Break the bow of Israel. That's speaking of, of breaking the military might of a nation. The current king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam II, he is the third generation after Jehu, who's the guy who would, who would bring all the bloodshed and wipe out King Ahab. Uh, King Jeroboam the second is the third generation, and when he dies, his son Zechariah will come to power and will die within six months. So that's, it's speaking of this, breaking the bow of Israel. And it will not only be a change in dynasties, but Megiddo, that city that's sitting up on the bluff, will be wiped out in 732 B.C., uh, some 15 years from this point. So there is, that's, he's, that's what he's predicting. Now, a side note, it doesn't apply to this verse, 
But the Valley of Jezreel is also the location of the future battle of Armageddon. Armageddon means hill or mountain of Megiddo. Uh, Armageddon will take place in the same valley. Now, we'll see that actual, the Armageddon thing come in later, but it doesn't happen here. Verse 6. And she conceived again. Gomer gets pregnant, conceives again, bore a daughter. Then God said to him, call her name Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Lo Ruhamah. And you see the, the word lo means no, not. It's, it's an, uh, an opposite word in Hebrew. Ruhamah, mercy. It can also be translated love. So it's like they're calling their little baby girl no mercy or not loved. Note to self, do not name your daughters this. Okay, this is not one of those, oh, look, dear, here's a Bible name. Let's call our daughter this. Wrong. Don't do that. Don't do that. But she will be a reminder that there will be a point in time when God will have no mercy on Israel. Verse 7. Yet I will, and remember Israel is which kingdom? North or south? North. Good. Verse 7. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. Which kingdom is Judah? The north or the south? Okay, so the north gets no mercy. The south will get mercy. I will have mercy on the house of Judah, will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle, but, uh, or by horses or horsemen. He will have mercy on Judah. Even though the northern kingdom will be wiped out by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom will not be. And when the Assyrians come against Hezekiah in Jerusalem, God promises to save the city. The people trust the Lord. They pray, and God sends one angel and wipes out 185,000 Assyrians in one night. That's in, that's in Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. Amazing thing that will happen. An amazing thing that will happen. And God promises that even here in the northern kingdom by Hosea. That he would have mercy and that he would save Judah. Verse 8. Now when she had weaned lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, call his name Lo, what does Lo mean? No, no or not, right? Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Now, the, you stick an I at the end of a Hebrew word, and it makes it possessive like mine. So Lo Ami means not my, and then Am is the word for people, not my people. It kind of makes you wonder. When Gomer's out pushing the kids with, his, with, you know, with her stroller, and here's the baby, that people could be asking her, whose child is this? And if, and if Hosea is along for the walk, and they say, whose child is this? Because they know about her. And they tell the name, not my people. What does that sound like? It's a mess. It's a mess. Talk about a messy family. Verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. They will prosper. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. See, things are going to change. Then the children of, of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Now, it talks about them a day when they would be gathered together. There will be a day when the nation of Israel wouldn't be two separate nations but they would have one nation. They would be united together. It's kind of like today. And he talks about great will be the day of Jezreel. Suggestion? Perhaps he's talking about Armageddon. Because that's coming, gang. There will be a day when there will be a battle. There will be something take place in Jezreel when the nations of the world are gathered together, not against Israel, but against their Messiah who's on his way. That's what the Bible tells us. Armageddon is not about the nations all fighting each other, gang. Armageddon is about the nations gathering to fight Messiah 
and he will show up and he will live. God will win. Great will be the day of Jezreel. I wonder if that's what it's hinting at. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy, mercy is shown. There will be a day when the not my people will be called my people. When the no mercy will be called and find mercy. Sometimes, friends, we can think that we have just gone too far and we have failed too many times that it's hard to see past the guilt and condemnation. I get it. I'll bet you we've all been there once or twice or many times. But gang, if you're still here and you're still breathing, I got news for you. God is not finished with you. God is not finished. And God has mercy. God has promises. But he's not finished. Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He's not done with you. He is not finished with you. Keep going. Don't give up. God hasn't given up on you. Don't you give up on you. Because here's this, you've got this, this confusing tragedy going on, this messy family. You hear about judgment. You hear about terrible things. And then you hear about this hope of mercy because there is mercy coming. Chapter 2, verse 2. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges. For she is not my wife. Now we're going to go back to the other way. For she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Let her put away her harlotry. You know, it happens today all the time, you know. Um, uh, moms give birth and they take the family leave thing and, you know, after a couple months, then it's not uncommon for moms to go back to work. Right? Right? Are you with me? Gomer went back to work. She went back to being a prostitute. Some of you know what that's like. The pain of betrayal. Some of you know what that's like. Be betrayed by the one you have loved the most, the one you have trusted yourself to, the one that you've counted on, the one that you've let go of mistrust and you've been hurt. I know it. I know it. Hosea is, experience, is experiencing the very thing that God has been going through with his own people who have pursued other gods. This is what God experiences. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But those, who, those of you who have been deeply betrayed, you know what? That's what God feels when we walk away from him. Remember a few years back the mess that came out into the press when the vice presidential candidate, John Edwards, they found out that he was having an affair? told her a few days earlier, I think John is back having that same affair with that woman again. On uh, de, uh, November, no, October 10th, 2007, there was a National Enquirer article reporting there had been an affair. And the very next day, they're on a tarmac at a private jet port in Raleigh, North Carolina, getting ready to leave, and Elizabeth has a meltdown. She says to her husband something like, you don't see me anymore. She ripped off her blouse. She ripped off her bra in front of everyone on the tarmac, all the congressional staffers, and she began to yell at her husband. Uh, Christina Reynolds testified that she and another staffer rushed to her, tried to cover her up, got her inside, and then she went home. She did not go on this campaign trip at all. There's a taste of the pain. Elizabeth Edwards, who would die, you know, remember she was, she was sick with cancer. He did this while she was, well, while, while she was undergoing cancer treatment. She describes the agony she experienced when she learned of her husband's infidelity. She writes, she wrote, after I cried and screamed, I went to the bathroom and threw up. And the next day, John and I spoke. He wasn't coy, but turned out that he wasn't forthright either. I felt that the ground underneath me had been pulled away. 
And for those of you who have been through this kind of pain, you know what? I got news for you. God gets it. You can say to your friends, you don't get it. You've never been hurt like this. And that's fine. You can t- we, we will own that. But I got news. There is somebody who knows. Oh my gosh, he knows. He knows the pain. You're going to see it through the book of Hosea. This is your book. God knows this pain. He writes to bring charges. This is the legal language of divorce. Hosea has a valid reason to divorce Gomer, just as God has a valid reason to divorce his people because of their unfaithfulness. And, and I'll just warn you up ahead, we're going to see some of the lines blurring. You're, you're going to wonder, well, is, he, is he talking about Hosea and Gomer, or is he talking about God and Israel? And the answer is Yes. Uh, sometimes one, sometimes the other, sometimes both. Sometimes both. Verse 3. Lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst, I will not have mercy on her children for they are the children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully for she said... I will go after my lovers who will give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Now, the, the idea of the lovers, we can, we can idea, we get the idea of what, what, what Gomer is talking about for Israel. It's the other gods that they were pursuing, that they worshipped, the other gods they trusted instead of Yahweh. Verse 6, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. Um, Returning to her first husband. It's kind of like the backslidden Christian who goes through trouble and begins to think, you know what? Life was a lot better when I was trusting God. I think I need to go back. Verse 8, for she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. God's saying, didn't you know, girl? It was me all the time, which they prepared for Baal. You're going to see the word Baal appear a few times. Baal, it, it means literally Lord. You might think of it as the name of the chief god of the Canaanites, which is correct, but the word itself means Lord or um, uh, master or owner. And sometimes it is used to refer to a husband. You're going to see them interchangeable here. Um, just to keep that for further reference, verse 9. Therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages which, that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish her. For the days of the Baals to which she burned incense, she decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, says the Lord. God says, I will punish her. Talking about his punishment of the northern kingdom. I need to talk to you for a few minutes about consequences. Sometimes... We have loved ones who behave badly. It might be a spouse, might be a family member, could be a parent, could be a, 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 a child, son or a daughter. And friends, sometimes we do the wrong thing by trying to keep them from experiencing the consequences of their actions. We, we end up trying to rescue them all the time. And sometimes, sometimes, And I'm going to say that a lot, sometimes. This is not hard, fast, works every time. You're going to have to figure this out. I'm still figuring this out. 
But sometimes when we keep rescuing people, all you're doing is keeping them trapped in their sin. Because the only thing that's going to wake them up is hitting bottom, hitting... uh, uh, You know, there is a place for mercy. You are going to see wonderful mercy in the book of Hosea. You're going to see forgiveness, restoration, grace in, in a wonderful way. But we need to be careful not to get in the way when God is intending to make things difficult for people as a natural consequence of their bad behavior. I am learning that sometimes, sometimes, Jail is not a bad thing. I know if you're somebody that's in trouble, you are trying as hard as you can to not get caught because you don't want to go to jail. But I got to tell you, I've learned in my advanced age that many of you finally turned around when you spent a few days or weeks or months or years in jail. I know. Because I've heard your story. Your loved one may cry and scream and, and, and tell you that you don't love them. But sometimes, friend, sometimes the most loving thing you can do is allow them to fall. Sometimes that's the best you can do. The trouble with this is sometimes we want people to experience the consequences because we're just angry at them. They've made my life miserable. And I'm tired of it, so I'm calling the police. (laughs) Like, like. How you boys put those guns down? (laughs) Say what? He likes this a little too much. Well, we're not just going to let you walk out of here. Who's we, sucker? Smith and Wesson and me. comes the famous line. Wait for it. Go ahead. Make my day. Now, I got to tell you, if your idea of helping people experience the consequences is, go ahead, make my day, well, you got the wrong attitude. Because consequences work best if they actually come out of love. Hebrews 12.5 says, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you do things out of anger, you're going you're gonna to regret it. You may be doing the wrong thing. And you, pro- and you may, at the, later on, feel guilty about what you've done. But if you are allowing consequences to flow because you love this person and you only want them to do well, you want them to to come to the end of the rope, well, then it might be a healthier thing. It's because God loves us that he allows us to experience trouble because of his great love. And sometimes we need to let other people experience the consequences. Verse 14. Therefore, behold... I will allure her. He's not kicking her to the curb. He's not done. He brings her back. 
I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there. And the valley of Achor, as a door of hope, she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. The valley of Achor. The word Achor means trouble. Um, and he's saying, I'm going to bring you from the valley of trouble to hope, to a door of hope. The valley got its name when a fellow named Achan in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, he had stolen and hidden some forbidden property during the conquest of Jericho back in the days of Joshua. And the Israel, Israelites suffered a, a horrendous defeat because of Achan's hidden sin. And they punished Achan by stoning him in this valley which they named Achor because they said, because he has troubled us and so we're going to trouble him. So this concept of the valley of trouble. When you are in a valley of trouble, you have choices to make. When you are in a world of hurt, you have choices to make. And how you come out of this valley depends on the choices you make. You can come out bitter, angry, blame everybody, or you can learn to take responsibility and turn around and start changing. If you deal with your sin, you may find hope at the end of the tunnel. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If you come out of the trouble by making the right choices, you're going to find things happening differently in your life. From trouble to hope. But it's up to you. What choices are you going to make? Verse 16. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. Now the word husband, the Hebrew word is ish is where we get husband, you add an I at the end, it makes it possessive, my husband, Ishi. The word for master, that's the word Baal, Baal-i, master or Lord. There are times in the Old Testament when God is actually referred to as Baal. Because remember, Baal simply means master or Lord. And so sometimes it's actually appropriate, it's okay to call, it was okay in a sense to call because that's what the word means, it's okay to call him your master and your Lord. The problem is, is that it get, got confusing when all the other idols became their masters and their lords, and they also started taking these names of Baal. And so God is saying, no more, you're going you're not gonna, you're gonna to stop calling me Baal. You're going to stop calling me, you're, no longer will you call me master. I kind of wonder, if you pull back and look at Hosea and Gomer, if a transition isn't going to happen in their relationship. Perhaps Gomer's no more going to call her, call him her master because he bought me. He originally bought me. But she's going to call him my husband. Um, fellows, just a little hint. It's much preferable if she calls you husband than if she calls you master. I know you want her to call you master but you know what husband is far better my husband my man that's my man i like that verse 17 for i will take from her mouth the names of the baals and they shall be remembered by their name no more in that day i will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground, bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Some of the words that he uses here are very interesting. These are intimate words. Betrothal speaks, it speaks of an engagement. But because there's been this divorce, this is like starting over afresh. This is like a brand new beginning. 
you may call it a renewal of their vows or something. Um, the word to know, yada, it means to know, but it also means to know. You know? Like in the biblical sense. So the words that he's weaving in here, you know what I'm talking about? Adam knew his wife and she got pregnant and had a kid. Knew, it's the same word. It's not just no. There, these are intimate terms, beloved. And with this idea of the relationship between God and us like a marriage, we're talking about intimacy with God. A new marriage. They're starting over. Verse 21, it shall come to pass in that, that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil. They shall answer Jezreel, which means what? Do you remember what that means? God sows. Verse 23, then I will sow her for myself. You see the tie-in? I will sow her to myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. You see all three children's names coming in? And, and everything's turned over. Um, I will have mercy. Mercy is here. The daughter, no mercy, is now going to be called mercy. The son, not my people, he's now going to be called my people. R Paul will quote this verse in Romans 9 to remind his readers that God will one day have compassion on the nation of Israel. God hasn't given up on them yet. And God hasn't given up on you either. It's like a new marriage. It's like an adoption. My favorite quote of all time was our furnace repair man comes into the house, stops dead in his tracks, and says, this looks like some kind of United Nations meeting. I was born in Bangkok. Bangalore, India. Connecticut. And I was born in Romania. Ethiopia. Which is in Africa. In China. <laughs> Sharon is the gas pedal, and I am the brakes. Over and over she'll say, I found this child who needs X and Y and Z, and all we'd have to do is fly over the ocean, get funding, connect the dot to here, and it'd be done. We're such victims of our culture because our culture tells us your kids have to look perfect and be in all the perfect schools, and you can't do that with a big family, but if you just concentrate on what's important, the rest will follow. People discouraged us. They thought we were going to ruin our lives by taking all these special kids, and they said, you don't know what to do. And it's true that we had no experience, and we didn't really know how to raise them. But you, you see what happens with unconditional love. You give a person unconditional love, and they, they blossom. I feel like having these kids has really helped us find our life, find our meaning, find our purpose. It took me decades to figure this out, but there's no physical thing that you can buy that's actually going to give you true peace and happiness. And the pure joy that will come from a, a rescue and a ransom of a child's life is probably the most satisfying thing you can imagine. We talk about adoption. We tell them they're adopted and 
we kind of tell them, you know, being born into a family, you don't even decide that. It kind of happens biologically. But when you're adopted, your parents looked out at the whole world and picked you. You think that they don't really know the gravity of them being rescued or saved. Then you'll see them in an external setting, like one of them is in front of 300 people last Friday night, and he tells people that he probably wouldn't be alive if he hadn't been adopted by his family. Those are the, like the goosebump moments when you go, he's got it. In Romania, at least at the time when I was born, um, when you were when you were born with a, a deformity, quote quote, it um, it was considered a curse by God. I was um, kind of distanced and not treated right, and kind of not really getting any care that a, a normal baby should, which is why when I was one and a half years old, I weighed nine pounds. It was rough in the, in the first year of my life, but I lived. But no matter where you were before, it's like where you can be now, your past doesn't define that. This family has proven that. It's just like you have a dying boy from Romania or starving kids from Africa, and you bring them to a, a place where they can be, I guess, human to the fullest, and that, that's, that's a generous thing. Loving others unconditionally, it's not just generous, it's what mercy is all about. And no matter how deformed you feel you are by your sin, oh my, he's looked out over the whole world and he's picked you. Can you think what, what Gomer went through? And of all the people that he could have picked, he picked her. My friends, if you've been away from the Lord, it's time to come back. It's time to come back. He has waiting for you mercy and compassion. But it's up to you. The choice is up to you. How will you respond? Do you realize that you're in a mess and you need to turn around? Or are you going to blow it off and keep going after your lovers and after your, your other stuff like, like Gomer did for so long? Do you hear God speaking to you today? Let's stand and pray.